Before we get started, I'd like to say for the holiday season, both Jeff and I will be taking a break from the show. Uh, we'll be back in the future with more episodes, so RCE will still be here. Yeah, so just wanted to make sure that uh, if you're watching the website of the RSS feed, you'll see a you know a, a gap of a couple of weeks before you see us start up again in January. Um, it's kind of a <laughs> It's kind of an unwritten rule. You're not supposed to put time-related uh, notices within the podcast, but, you know, we just want to make sure that you're all aware that we'll be gone for a couple weeks, but then we'll be back after the holiday season. Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and again, I have from OpenMPI and Cisco Systems, Jeff Squires. Jeff, thanks for joining us from your offices halfway across the country. Good morning, Brock. How's it going? Not bad. Uh, today, we've had a, a guest that uh, we've been trying to get on the show for a little while, and luckily, we've found some time to get them on. We have uh, David Vanderspool. Uh, from Gromax, the uh, I believe it's an MD package. I have a number of users that use Gromax, and it's pretty familiar, and I believe it's involved with some other projects out there. Uh, he's at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, so we're actually six hours time zone different here, so thanks, David, for uh, you know helping us out at such a different time. Yeah, and I, I want to say, I want to give the standard disclaimer here up at the front, a uh, little known secret. We do a little coordination before we start recording these things, and we have definitely determined that we cannot pronounce uh, David's name properly, and we cannot pronounce his university properly or his town properly because we're ugly Americans. So we give all the standard disclaimers and uh, apologize for all of that in advance. <laughs> okay. well, well, I appreciate they- that you guys are trying anyway, so. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us your involvement with Gromax? Yeah, so I'm a professor of uh, computational molecular biophysics in the the biology department uh, in the University of Uppsala and have been working on Gromax for close to 20 years now. So let's roll right in. Um, I'm sure not everybody listening knows what Gromax is or uses a a, a similar – there's a number of – MD packages out there. Uh, is Gromax an MD package or am I completely off base here? No, you're absolutely right. It's a molecular dynamics simulation package and the abbreviation it stands for Groningen Machine for Chemical Simulation, uh, which is a quite ugly name, but Gromax is uh, easy to recall, I would think. What was a little bit of the history behind Gromax? Like, where did it come from? What was its intended purpose from inception? So in the late 80s, uh, people started experimenting with parallel computing, and since molecular dynamics is a well-known resource hawk, uh, parallel computing was an obvious thing to do. Uh, And basically, we started uh, from scratch writing a code in C uh, based on older MD codes that were around uh, with the functionality that we knew. And we started uh, doing stuff in parallel on transputers and then moved on to more common things like workstation clusters from there. Uh, transputers? Uh... So this is a special kind of chip made by an, an English company called InMOS who uh, built a chip that had built-in communication hardware 15 years before the Opteron. Uh, it was very ingenious, but Alas, computing and, and programming was a bit cumbersome, uh, so it was hard to use in, in effect. So I have to ask, if you were uh, using transputers back in the early 90s and, and late 80s, did you happen to use LAM, perchance? I don't think we used LAM. No, we, we had uh, the things in a box hooked up to a Sun computer, and we were programming an OCAM, and OCAM was hell because of the... Uh, weird rules for uh, writing the code that you have fixed indentation and just when I thought I I got over that bit with fixed uh, indentation coding then Python came on and I thought well (laughs) bad things never go away oh wow yeah the reason I ask is because it's a little known fact is today's the day for secrets and little known facts apparently that uh, LAM MPI it's it's very first target was transputers back in the early 90s and it was actually a publicity stunt to add the MPI layer, which eventually became the, the dominant and uh, most used part of it. But uh, I just haven't heard the word transputers in many years. So <laughs> small, small world. Well, that's the history. 
Yes. Excellent. Well, so uh, who uses Gromax and, and why do they use it? So you talked a little bit about the history and, uh, you know, that uh, parallelism was an obvious target. Could you give us some examples, too, about, you know, why you needed to spread onto multiple machines and how did that spread throughout the, the community? So uh, who uses Gromax? Let's start there. I think uh, in, in chemistry and biology is our main target. We also have quite a few physicists out there. And people use it for anything that you can use the kind of classical model for. So anything from biomolecules to carbon nanotubes to gases. Um, I guess there are about five to 10,000 academic users, quite a few industrial users as well. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we have we have a mailing list with 2,000 people on there, So and they're willing to stand uh, send out with 40 emails per day so it's quite a quite a spam there but uh so these there's probably more users than the, than these that are subscribed to the mailing list yeah so, we always find it's it's very hard to tell you know particularly in open source you know how many users do you have you have no idea because you know the the silent majority of people who just download and use you you have no idea but it's nice to hear that you have so many subscribers and and so much of an active uh mailing list community that's a that's a very good indicator <laughs> So I'm sorry, I, I did ask you a barrage of questions there. Let me let me go through uh, a different one of those again because I asked you all at once. When you when you started Gromax back in the history part there, how, what how did you do the parallelism itself? You you mentioned some of the the models that you used and whatnot, but back in the the early '90s and whatnot was before even MPI was standardized. PVI PVM was just starting to come out, and there were you know dozens of different parallel models before kind of the community settled on one. So how did you guys develop this? Uh, you know, how did you, what models did you end up using and, and why? Yes, well, apart from OCAM, we, we tried a few things. So this was basically before PVM even. Uh, so there we had a homebrew, homebrew uh, compiler uh, that did parallel Pascal and was made at the computer science department in our university in Groningen in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, we, we played with that as well, but we found it wasn't stable enough. So the first try was to go for C with a, a commercial library for parallel parallelism. And I think we used that for a little while, and then we uh, moved on to, finally we moved on to PVM and later on MPI. Um, if it's of interest, we actually also built a, a, a machine with another kind of hardware, Intel i860s that used to end up in printers and stuff because they were good for that stuff, um, with a special hardware communication, which was also made for us by a company. And we had a, a big rack full with 32 of these boxes, 32 processors, each of them five megaflops or so. So this, this was really breakthrough performance at the day. So you guys really used a lot of specialty hardware. You were really kind of digging to find every every little bit you could of performance that was out there at the available technology at the time. Yes, initially it was even worse or even more ambitious, I should say, uh, in that we were planning to make our own, uh, implement the algorithms in hardware, basically. Uh, but we soon found out that this basically was beyond our capabilities. And this is when we moved on to a programmable chip with special purpose communication, but the, at least a programmable chip for the main part of the code. And that was the transputer? I'm not familiar with them. So No, this was, this was the i860 from Intel. Oh, okay. So trans yeah, this was quite a bit faster than the transputer, actually. So when you say programmable, you mean software programmable, not like hardware programmable, like an FPGA or something. Exactly. This was just a normal processor. That is, so this was basically Intel's first uh, try at a fast processor, a RISC-like processor, like they did later with the Itanium, uh, but they basically gave up on it. Okay. So moving into how you derive modern performance, when I was building Gromax and I've built several versions of it for several users with different options on and off, uh, where are you deriving most of your performance? I noticed there was a lot of assembly in there. It's pretty much all the, is a lot of Gromax in assembly or? Well, this is fun that you should ask this because um, from version 3.0, which was released um, in 2001, 
uh, we had lots and lots of assembly, which was hand coded by a PhD student, Eric Lindahl, who basically decided one beautiful day that he had nothing better to do. So he sat down for half a year and programmed basically one million lines of assembly. Now it sounds worse than it is because many of these lines were actually copies with small modifications. Um, but this has served us very well and this is a lar to a large part where the performance comes from. But very recently we actually dropped all the assembly. So we went from a million to zero lines of assembly. And what we're doing now is we have normal C code with this assembly intrinsics, which are portable. Uh, and in that sense, much easier to, to use. So basically we're moving away from that. Interesting. So this is like a standard thing where you can basically call C functions that call the assembly for you, similar to SSE intrinsics? It's a bit like that, yeah. It is SSE intrinsics, actually. This, this is the real, the, the real name. Uh, and we're just using these, um, and actually we're generating our code as well. We're not um, writing down all the code ourselves, but we're generating all our loops, and that makes it much more uh, manageable. Um, another thing that we have been using extensively uh, in order to get performance is not calculating anything if we know that the result is going to be zero. And there's actually quite a bit of that in, in MD and I presume in many codes. So if you're going to multiply two numbers and one of them is zero, then you might as well not do it because you know the result beforehand. Interesting. So you can actually do a, a compare and branch and that's faster than doing a multiply is what you're well, saying. Well, the thing is we know beforehand, so we load up our, our molecules and we know beforehand the properties of these things. And not all, for instance, not all atoms in our molecule have a charge. Now, if we don't have a charge, then we don't have to calculate the, the charge, charge interaction, the Coulomb interaction. And we basically mask out these atoms for the rest of the calculation. So we do the masking once, and then we can use that mask for the rest of the calculation, which can run for days. So ah, that's okay. easily gained. I see. So it, it's not you're you're not doing a test and compare before every single multiply. It's more of an intelligent macro level kind of thing that you can mask out, like you said, entire atoms and molecules. Hmm. Exactly, and 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 the same actually applies to um, to much of our code. Basically, we're we're trying to use smart algorithms and um, also avoid if statements. I mean, who's ever tried to optimize any code knows that if you have an if statement in in a loop that uh, the processor is going to choke on it. So we just take the if statements out of our inner loops and basically multiply the loops. And then you have 10 loops instead of one loop with 10 if statements, but they go a whole lot faster. Cool. So you mentioned, uh, well, Brock and you both mentioned SSE. Do you use any of the other intrinsics like MMX and some of the other advanced things that are great for math? Uh, actually, yeah. So this is not my personal work. This is Eric Lindahl, but he has implemented the stuff for MMX, uh, 3D Now, um, VMX on PowerPC. We got some help for, for uh, tuning on BlueGene. Uh, also, we had Itanium assembly at one stage with help from HP, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, so people are also eager to, to help us with, uh, with optimization. Cool. Do you, do you have optimizations for some of the newer chips like, uh, you know, Nehalem's? And I'm sorry, I forget the name of the most recent AMD. Is it Shanghai? Uh, Istanbul. Istanbul, thank you. Yeah, so I think we're not using anything above SSE 2 or 3, and I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think the Nihalems and, and things like that use, uh, they have more cores, they are better at predicting and stuff, but what is actually quite fun about the Nihalems is that we can actually now, for the first time, use hyperthreading. So if we use two processes on one core uh, with hyperthreading, we get about 80% gain in, in throughput. That's fascinating because in the prior generations, you know, the hyperthreading in, in the Harper Towns and the other Xeons and whatnot really wasn't all that effective from HPC. But this is, uh, this is neat to hear because Intel has told me that uh, they, they really like the hyper-threading in the Halem and we should be trying it for HPC applications. And uh, it's really refreshing to hear that from out in the real world that people are seeing some, some improvements. That's cool. 
Yes, it's, it's and it's basically for free. Uh, and the other stuff that we got for free uh, a couple of times now is the is the widening of the bus. So initially the SSC was 32 bit and it turned 64, now 128 bits. And each time that happened has actually given us almost a factor of two in performance for this part of the code where we are actually using that because you're basically doing four instructions uh, simultaneously instead of one. So a quick question though, um, I was under the impression that most MD codes were memory bandwidth bound. Um, I mean, are you doing intelligent blocking on cache sizes on these different CPU types and trying to intelligently use memory? I always understood they kind of operated at a fraction of the processor's theoretical performance because the memory couldn't keep up. Yes, yes and no. So with infinite cache, you're CPU bound, but with not infinite cache, which we have to live with, uh, memory is important, but you can do quite simple workarounds there. You can basically sort your problem, sort your coordinates such that you are uh, in a better order for the memory, and in that way actually also gain like a factor of two. So by sorting our uh, calculations such that they stream through memory faster, uh, you gain almost a factor of two in performance. Okay, yeah, because I'm involved with a project here at the University of Michigan that uh, um, uses uh, GPUs uh, and their high memory bandwidth to do MD calculations, and they're having good results with that. Are you guys looking at using any of these new, uh, you know, strange hardware that's becoming available again? Absolutely. Uh, we are collaborating with, with Vijay Pandey at Stanford, who's doing the Folding at Home project. Uh, and they have uh, a couple of people at the computer science at Stanford uh, looking into GPUs, uh, and they have for a long time actually. Uh, so the streaming computing is is, is quite uh, quite big, but it has its drawbacks right now. But it it may get there that it's competitive. Right now it's not really competitive yet, uh, but it it may get there absolutely. Oh, what kind of drawbacks are you uh, running into um, that we should be aware of? Oh, well, until very recently, you couldn't have integers, um, and that makes life quite miserable for a programmer. But this has been solved now with the latest, uh, what is it, CUDA uh, and OpenCL. Um, also, I think only very recently, the first cards have become available that allow you to do double precision calculations. Uh, but the biggest drawback is basically the interface between the CPU and the GPU. And this makes it prohibitive to uh, do a lot of communication. So basically you have to move your whole uh, application to the GPU and calculate for a long time and then move some stuff back to the CPU and store it. Uh, and this is, makes also scaling at the moment very difficult. So it's difficult to scale beyond a couple of GPUs that you have in the box. Wow, so you're not doing the, the typical CPU plus GPU kind of thing, or at least typical to me. Uh, you're actually moving the, the bulk of your code down into the GPU and, and deliberately limiting your CPU-GPU communication. Is that an accurate characterization? Yes, if we, if we don't do that, then it's pointless, basically. So the GPU is three, two to f ten times faster than the CPU, but that's one core of the CPU for us. So if I have a box with uh, with eight cores, then that is faster than uh, than one GPU for sure. And depending on the problem a bit, it's it could also be faster than four GPUs. Uh, so it is only for certain problems that it's actually useful. Uh, oh, that's interesting too, because that is kind of the basis of of Intel's argument about why they haven't really made much of a foray into the, the accelerator market is because they're saying, well, we'll just put more and more cores on there and that'll do effectively the same thing. And so you're kind of confirming that or at least saying that the, the picture is very gray and it's, it's uh, you know, dependent upon your application as to what you're going to see. Hmm, fascinating. I, I always love hearing, you know, confirmation of what the, the marketing guys say with the people who are actually really using the products and doing real science. Um, Okay, moving on beyond the, the accelerator thing, let me uh, throw another question in here. The effects of NUMA. So, uh, you know, before we had these accelerator technologies, 
you must have been dealing with pneuma effects for a long time, not just with Optron, but with things even earlier than that and so on. How, uh, how does your code take advantage of that or exploit that or have to be aware of that? Uh, until now, we have basically relied on, on the MPI library to do this kind of stuff for us. Uh, and that's actually, so we basically haven't bothered so much. Oh, okay. And that has worked quite well. I mean, the Open MPI that we have used a lot in LAM MPI before that has quite good support for SMP uh, communication. Uh, and we've just used that as is. Um, we are thinking about going into mixed parallelism, though, and it's not entirely what you're asking for, but where we basically combine SMP computing on one node and with MPI communication between nodes. And the obvious reason for that is that uh, you basically streamlining the communication between nodes uh, such that you have larger but fewer messages between the nodes than you would if you would have one core, uh, one MPI task, uh, which is, I think, the uh, more common paradigm for parallel computing. All right, very, very cool. So do you, so actually with that model, then the NUMA effects might actually become even more important. Is that something you anticipate looking into? I'm not. I'm not really sure how we could take advantage of Numa. Uh, I guess. Uh, it, let me rephrase my question. It's not so much to take advantage of, but make sure not to hurt yourself because of Numa. Or are you just basically relying on the OS, and the OS does a good enough job of the memory placement and whatnot? Well, I think this was an issue with Linux previously that these uh, processes were not tightly coupled to a CPU, and if you had an operating system uh, event going on. Uh, that all the processes could be shifted to the next core or something, and that would, of course, hurt per cache performance quite a bit, uh, which is, by the way, is one of the reasons why Cray are developing their own Linux version, which is basically taking out the operating system noise, as they call it, in order to, to streamline performance even more. But I think nowadays uh, this is quite well handled in Linux, so it's not a big deal. Okay. Do you use uh, – here's another curiosity, which is uh, – I'll explain myself in a minute here. But do you actually probe Linux and whatnot to find out what the cache sizes are, or do you just kind of have hard-coded defaults in there? No, we don't do anything like that. Um, the only thing that we sometimes do is we use the, the FFTW library for fast Fourier transforms, and they have this built-in algorithms for testing which version of their algorithm is fastest. Uh, so that that can that can be done, and I'm not sure what they are doing under the hood. But oh, for okay. us, f f so for us, the performance is really dominated by what kind of problem you happen to do. And I mean, yeah, if we're not taking advantage of more or less cash explicitly. Gotcha. The, the reason I mention it is, uh, I'm sorry, is a little bit of an advertisement. Is there's another new sub project under OpenMPI called HW Loc Hardware Locality that uh, can report to you exactly what your cache line sizes are and which processors share which cache and so on. So I uh, didn't know if that would be useful to you or not. It could in principle be. I mean, we, I don't think we, uh, we have thought about it uh, in great detail, but I could imagine that you could unroll your loops a bit more if you know you have more cache or something like that. And since we're doing this automatically, it might actually be possible to create multiple loops for the same uh, kind of calculation uh, which can take advantage of that. So that, that's an interesting idea. Okay, moving on to some uh, other tools and complementary bits to Gromax. What tools do you normally use with Gromax? I mean, Gromax is a core MD package, but it's, it's not visualization as far as I know. What, what do you use in your own workflow with Gromax? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So there, there's a, a few packages, I would say, and it depends a bit on on, on which user. But uh, So we like PyMol a lot, which is a molecular graphics program by Warren Delano, who passed away recently, unfortunately. Uh, other people use uh, VMD from the Klaus Schulten Group at Illinois. Um, let's see. This is also visualization then. Then there is a couple of, of uh, quantum chemistry packages which you can use in conjunction with Gromax, uh, and that includes actually most of the of the of the used packages, you know, Gaussian games, CPMD, uh, and a couple more actually. Uh, so these can be used. 
Um, then there's a couple of yeah more related or more or less related programs like um, uh, what if which you can use for some kind of um, pre-processing uh, and then of course we could create lots of, of simple line graphs and people use XM Grace or GNU plot to plot these or or Excel what have you <laughs> so anything and everything no, I, that's actually correct, yeah. Not... <laughs> I was reading and there was some mention to Gromax and folding at home. Uh, what's the relationship between Gromax and folding at home? Yeah, so since a couple of years, I think five or six years, the folding at home uh, project uses Gromax for most of their simulations. Uh, so if you're downloading the folding at home screensaver, you might be running Gromax on the, under the hood. And the reason why this is is that... Um, of course, performance, and one of the Gromax developers uh, was a postdoc at Stanford at the time, I think, and then this was initiated, and since then, they have been using Gromax a lot. And what is, could you give a quick rundown of what Folding at Home is? Right, so Folding at Home started out as a distributed computing project, uh, where basically volunteers download the screensaver for their Windows or Mac boxes or Linux even, um, which runs in the background as soon as your CPU is idle. Uh, it, it gets uh, a protein structure from the server and then it does a, a molecular dynamics simulation and the aim with this is to predict the structure of the protein uh, from the simulation. And this was actually quite successful, so they have been able to um, predict the structures or post dict I should say, because these were known structures, so they could actually uh, check the results. Uh, but they have done this for quite a few uh, proteins. And since then, they have moved on into basically all kind of uh, biochemical uh, problems that you can study with this kind of software. Okay. Um Going back just a little minute here, so um, Brock asked you what other tools are used. I want to ask you what other um, middleware and tools are used inside of Gromax. You mentioned MPI, for example, and you also mentioned FFTW. Um, is there other building blocks that you build Gromax on top of? Actually, we're trying to avoid uh, too many dependencies because it, it can be painful, but uh, MPI is, of course, uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, all modern uh, desktops even have uh, two to four cores, so you want to run MPI there. Uh, then we use the FFTW for the fast free aid transforms, but we can also use vendor libraries like Intel's MKL or, or things like that. Um, other than that, there's actually not a whole lot. Uh, we, we have some anal analysis tools that use, for instance, the GNU scientific library, um, but that's basically it. No, hang on. We also use BLAS and LAPAC for, for a very small subset of, of problems that we use. Matrix gotcha. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me go off on a, on a different tangent here then. How, um, how does the Gromax community work? How do you add new features? How do you do, you know, find out what people want and, and need and, and so on and actually then get that implemented inside Gromax? Yeah, so all the important communication takes place on the Gromax developer mailing list uh, and this is often where you will find people who will come with more detailed questions than just uh, normal user stuff, how do I do this uh, so people say I want to implement this and that and then we tell them well by all means and if they do it and they provide us a patch then we, then we can implement it um, other than that there's a, a couple of groups who have uh, developers that can actually add uh, stuff to our source code repositories. Um, so these are based in Sweden and Germany and a couple in the States as well. Um, I think there are maybe 15, 20 active developers right now. That's great. 
So how do you find the, the quality of random patches uh, that come in? Do you find uh, – we, we in OpenMPI, you know, periodically get patches from the wild, so to speak. And some of them are great and, and some of them are, you know, the it works for me quality and need to be hardened up before they can be put in the mainline code base and whatnot. Do you find similar or, or how does that work? I guess we, we have the same problem there that not, not everything is – a great uh, coding wise but on the other hand our own code is not so great either because it has a history of 20 <laughs> years okay. and we're working on it but you know this always has somehow lower priority than getting new features and bug fixes so cleaning up is not high in the priority list unfortunately gotcha um, so you mentioned 15 to 20 active developers and so on how do you maintain that as a community, do you rely, rely pretty much solely on email for communication or, you know, have you been working with these people so long that it's just easy to communicate and work with each other and you see your, each other at conferences and things like that? It's a bit of a mix. Uh, so some of the people I've known for 15 years, of course, and, and others uh, have become recently, uh, have become developers recently only. Um, so. It's, it's a mixture. So we use, of course, uh, uh, software for the source code management. We use Git. Um, we actually we just switched this year from CVS to Git, which was a bit painful in the beginning, but it's, it's getting there. Um, but communication is mainly over the, over the developer mailing list. And this is also good because it's, it's basically the communications are stored in that manner in, on different servers around the world. Uh, on a similar line, uh, what features are coming to Gromex in the future? Is there something in the pipeline right now that's sitting in the Git repo that's not an official release? Uh, yes, there are some uh, some things. We're working on support for more force fields, so more models to use with your chemistry that you're interested in. Uh, even better scaling. Uh, so this is also um, been done and has to be test it until it can be released of course uh, this mixed parallelism is on the line which I would just mentioned uh, a couple of new algorithms um, most of most of the new stuff that so some of the of the performance stuff is basically what we're developing ourselves because um, of course we're trying to get inspiration from others uh, but uh, we have quite quite good uh, performance already so we have to find, come up with new stuff to make it better uh, we're trying to implement other algorithms that, that people have published, basically, um, for stuff that users want in applications. So it, it occurs to me that we actually completely forgot to ask you something earlier in the interview here. Uh, what exactly is Gromax? Is it is it middleware? Is it an API? How do you how do you use this as a user? in uh, your workflow? Do you export language bindings or are there command line tools or how does it work? Okay, so it's completely command line driven. So we have 80 to 100 programs uh, that you use from the command line. Um, well, then Git a, should have been a natural uh, mapping for you guys, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I mean, this Git is not one-to-one -one with CVS, so that is basically... Being, that's being very true. I'm sorry. I, I went totally off topic there. Yeah. No, but... Uh, uh, we have so 80 to 100 command line tools, which can be a bit much for, for the beginners, especially if they have never used a command line before. But uh, to our defense, all the, all the programs have basically the same interface. So they have a dash H flag, which you are used to for help. And uh, so it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. But we're, someday maybe we'll get a GUI as well, but not, not just yet. I've had a number of users at my own site use some third-party packages that uh, rely on libgmx from inside Gromax. So I do know some people who are using a bit of the Gromax uh, library, you could say, outside of the command line tools that come with Gromax. This is new to me. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was hard. It's like, I need libgmx. Like, what? <laughs> it was new okay. to me, too. Okay, that's interesting. No, but there are stuff. There is quite a bit of stuff going on that, and not everyone is communi communicating everything to us as well. So people publish uh, basically variants of the the Gromax software where they hacked in their own stuff, 
so in some cases actually we had to tell them to please put it under the GPL under the GNU public license which we also are using uh, but other than that everything is everyone is welcome to do whatever they like with it of course so the whole uh, project's under the GPL yes actually this is um, until now it has been on the GPL and we are considering putting part or all of it under the, the lesser the GPL to allow, for instance, uh, commercial packages to link to it. But we haven't taken a formal decision yet. So, so how so, would you do a, a formal decision like that in an informal community like you've got? Um, you know, what kind of consensus do you need? Are there actually intellectual and legal issues involved there or is it just kind of a straw vote? No, I think we're basically three main guys who who decide this between us, between us, and that's as simple as that. Okay. Okay, and this is a quick thing before we end here. There's a lot of different uh, MD packages out there with different focuses, whether it's material science or biology or you know chemical systems. Um, what other packages do you admire as a you know an MD user and developer? Yeah, to be really honest, I have not so much experience with other packages because basically from the beginning we decided to develop our own. However, very recently uh, there has been a new addition to a new kid on the block, so to speak, uh, which is uh, the code called Desmond. By it's made by a company, D. Shaw at. Uh, uh, who are have their offices at uh, Manhattan, and they've also built a special purpose computer. So basically, this they did what we set out to do 20 years ago, and this has shown phenomenal performance actually. So it is like two, three orders of magnitude faster than anything else that you can do. Uh, so this is really an uh, impressive thing. So how does one get involved in Gromax? Let's say I'm a random uh, user and or developer out there and so on. How would I, you know, go about joining your community and, and uh, you know, actually contributing code and, and doing things like that? Yeah, it's, it's very low key. So basically you write an email to the GMX developer list um, and saying, I would like to do this and that, uh, uh, but I don't know how to do it or something or where should I start? And then you will get some friendly advice and, that's that's about it and um, people are also welcome to uh, to drop by if they have uh, bigger plans uh, and and stay with us and work with us for a while or with one of the other partners in Stanford or in Germany or in Stockholm so we are open to all kinds of contributions really yeah, you never want to turn down a free contribution that's how open source works right <laughs> well to a point of course and I sure yes, to a point can. yeah um, so if the sometimes it's more work for for us than 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 the gain basically. So that's of course where you have to draw the line. But it's not always so easy to predict that beforehand. Yes, it's it's the enthusiasm that you don't want to dampen, uh, regardless of the quality of the work. <laughs> sometimes, exactly. and that is a fine line to tread. Indeed. So contact information, downloading Gromax, uh, where's all that located, websites, mailing list addresses? So the easiest way is just to go to www.gromax.org and there you will find pointers to mailing lists, uh, to downloads and um, also archives of, of the mailing lists and stuff. So you can really find everything there. We also have a bugzilla where, of course, there's also a link to that. So everything is really on that one website. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, David. Thank you very much for taking some time out to, uh, to speak with Jeff and I, and uh, this show will go out soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Right, we appreciate your time. Have a good holiday season. The same. <laughs>